Hello and welcome to the far away nearby. I am your host, DJ Star Sage. The Duchess Sue is indisposed tonight. Unfortunately, her royal subjects have informed us that she may have laryngitis. So, without further ado, we will carry on. And I am joined by a very special guest. The lady who keeps her Nobel Prize in the toilet because it keeps her grounded. Oh, dear God. Brenda Boo. Why, why, thank you for that illustrious introduction. Brenda and I had gotten together because we wanted to discuss a television show that we've both been watching. And we decided to review the Hulu TV series, Difficult Paul. So this is a, a show where a gay man is bestie, redhead, sassy, right there. They're, uh, they're best friends. They go through life in New York. They're aspiring comedians, and their outlook on life is a little negative, self-involved, and entitled. We're going to go ahead and start a round of questions that we've bounced around and talk about this new guilty pleasure. So, Brenda, what elements of difficult people appealed to you most? One of the things I really like about it is that there's not a cast of just pretty people. There's so many different physical types. Uh, for example, Denise, the owner of the restaurant where Billy works, uh, she's a big woman. I mean, there's no getting around it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I like the way that she doesn't, uh, there's no apologies for her size. She's... Um, you know, she really embraces and uses her body, whereas usually when you see a bigger person, there's always like a certain amount of shame wrapped around it. But I don't feel like her character has any of that. Um, mm-hmm. They're not politically correct at all. <laughs> no way. <laughs> which I really like. It, and it doesn't feel like at the end of the show, you're going to be feeling like I've learned a lesson. I don't feel like that at all. And um, I like that they um, are... A lot of times their own worst enemy, which I tend to do, sabotage myself quite a bit. And you don't you don't see it till after it's done because you've got all this baggage and all these emotions. And it's just, you know, they're kind of going through life like, fuck you and fuck you. I've never seen a show with the F-bomb dropped quite so much as this show. <laughs> so, so, those are some of the things I really like about how about you? Well, I would say that probably what drew me to the show is that it seemed like a refreshing change from a lot of what current television has all, been all about. I mean, for a number of years, it seems like the emphasis in TV has been reality television, and everyone has gotten sick of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a while now, they've been trying hard to bring back the return of the sitcom. And that, of course, probably started with Hot in Cleveland. And Ugh, what a, I, do you like that show? What a piece <laughs> of shit that is. I've tried to watch it and oh my God. It's, well, I, it's probably like a it? gay boy's guilty pleasure because of all the, you know, the divas that are in it. It's not my, it wasn't a, a favorite show, but there were some good lines in it, especially Betty White's, you know, with, uh, with difficult people, I felt like it was bringing back a familiar dynamic that you would see in network television two main characters and they're trying to get by life in the city so you've got a setting that's in you know the heart of a metropolis and you've got two people who are kind of an odd couple and they each have their own strengths and uh, i like you saw that they really had no apologies for their action and you know, if you work any sort of a corporate type of job where you have to be straight laced during the day, it's just um, refreshing to see a comedy like this where it's about people that have no excuses. <laughs> no, and they don't care. I I love the first episode where they're they're in the theater to see Annie and the little kids come walking in front of them. And that's something I've actually done where Julie's in a conversation and she just stops and midpoint doesn't say anything because she sees these kids. And I've done that exact same thing. It's just like, Oh, are you kidding me? Children? (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. And then there's the whole, um, you know, 
do you go to the movies or not? Because this could be a time where kids are there. And is it before or after school? Is it a weekend, a holiday weekend? Is school out kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Saturday matinees. <laughs> You're just asking for a bunch of children to write. And I love the way the mother is so – there's this whole breed of women – that have children this, you know, last decade or so that are so like mama bear about everything. And she's just like, do you mind? You're swearing in front of my children. And then, you know, in no normal situation would people be like, uh, no, I can't stop cursing. I paid $120 <laughs> to see this show. And you're like, that's what you want to say, but nobody says it. And I, I was just waiting for the Julie character to spout off and say she had some sort of a medical condition and she couldn't help it. <laughs> but they're so unapologetic about it. It's just like, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't do that. I love that. I like that one. Um, can I just say that one of my favorite parts in the first episode is when later they go to this guy which turns out to be this woman's husband and he is in the water business and they're trying to sell him this ridiculous notion about uh, water fountain water and at one point they kind of stop their spiel and they look in the back and Julie says are those your kids and he says yeah that's uh, Memphis and that's Maverick and she's like what the girl is Memphis and the boy is Maverick then really says what the girl is Memphis and the boy is Maverick and they both go, we got to go. And they get up leave. Like I, this is like, to me, they're in, I could see their thought process, right? Like anybody who names their children, these ridiculous names is, is nobody that I want to try to convince that I have a good idea or even deal with. We're out of here. <laughs> Right. I've got I have no interest in making contact with somebody whose thought processes are like that. Because inevitably they run into that same uh well, they run into the guy's wife at the party later. <laughs> yes. And they're all really confrontational, right? Because the mm -hmm. the woman's like, Oh, I recognize you and then she's like, Oh, that's right. I saw you at the theater and you're both terrible people. Who has these <laughs> kind of confrontations with strangers? <laughs> and of course you know in secret that that woman is so terrible that her husband's having an affair anyway yeah probably <laughs> he did seem kind of weak if we're going to give him a backstory i'd say he definitely has a yeah, she seems like a ball buster <laughs> <laughs> that would bring us to our next question among all the chemistry and everything that goes on in the difficult people world do you have a favorite character well in terms of actors, my favorite, of course, is Andrea Martin. And I, I love the episode when Tina Fey comes to her house and she's like, hi, I'm Tina Fey. And she's like, yes. She's just like, no, so nonplussed by this very famous person <clears throat> coming to her front door. And uh, <clears throat> she's uh, and then talking about that she wants, Tina wants somebody to be able to use her brownstone steps for a part of her show. And then she asked, uh, Andrea says, do you direct? And she says, yes. And then she goes, this big spiel. And Andrea says, a simple yes would do. You know, she just... <laughs> so in terms of actors, she's my favorite. But character, just pure character wise, it's got to be Arthur. Because oh. um, he's just this kind of gem that's in the background that doesn't... He, he's not a focal point, but when he does say stuff, it's just perfect and priceless and his timing is wonderful and i really like him i'm glad that you said that because ironically arthur is also my favorite character and i think if if the duchess were here with us uh in this session she would probably say so also just so many lovable qualities about him and the funny thing is if you look right at it I think that Arthur might be too good for Julie. Yeah. So, <laughs> definitely. Of course, it probably doesn't take much to be good for too good for either Julie or Billy. <laughs> Do you remember, like, the first time you get introduced to the Arthur character? She walks in the door, and the two basset hounds, "Hello, babies! Hello, angels!" And then Arthur says, "Hello, you know, pumpkin spice or whatever name he has for," her. and she goes. Hello, Arthur. Her voice just totally drops. It's just like, oh, it's you. Yeah, hello. It, it, it makes you wonder if it's his apartment or hers. I think they live together. So, Well, yeah, but then there's that, that whole dynamic of sometimes somebody's got bad credit 
you know, one's riding the other's coattails. Uh-huh. But my brother Jughead's in a similar situation where he and his girlfriend just bought a house together recently and come to find out the house is really in her name and he's just allowed to live there. Oh, yeah. He figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. But yeah, I, I really like the Arthur character. And one of the best moments that kind of typifies him is when Julie is sick. And oh. here he is in the background. He's, you know, being a nurturer and he's making up all this food to take care of her. And then she suddenly says that soup stinks. Yeah, six times. And- of, he made six kinds of homemade soup for her. Yeah. <laughs> and my husband Billy and I were watching it together and don't you know he sat there through the episode with me and he counted out the sounds of six pots of soup being dumped out is that right that's <laughs> funny <sighs> well two of my favorite Arthur moments they're at that, that very first episode they're at that party the big confrontation gone down between the lady and, and Annie and Billy and Julie and something really horrible has happened, and there's a shot of him. He pops a piece of cheese in his mouth. He's just like, so, just like, oh, it's just another party with my woman. And uh, I think it's one of the last ones, a series where he comes to the restaurant to help, taking it over and made it into a children. And there's been a crime, a rash of a child molester around, and they put a, a drawing up. And he looks up at the TV that's in the restaurant and he goes, hey, that looks like me. <laughs> it's just, like happy about it. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, that was a priceless moment. So um, how do you, you know, the, uh, the show never explains it. It just kind of starts midstream. So if you had to guess, how do you think Julie and Billy met? I think they met in something like that. Something related on comedy or either that or college. What did you think? Well, it's it's interesting you say that because I was thinking that too that they because there there was an episode where they um, they had booked a comedy routine and of course they were um, nonplussed by the the gal in the uh, the wheelchair <laughs> Andrea uh, who was funnier than her name is Mumford Andrea Mumford there is so that's another thing I like about it it's like in no other TV show would you see a character in a wheelchair they would be like everybody would be reverential and respectful and they just treated her like any other ding dong right but carry on I'm sorry <laughs> right because uh, you know later on they're trying to decide not to feel sorry for her or not and then she ends up being a you know a little piece of work she hit on her boyfriend yeah. You're fucking that? She says, if you want a quality piece of ass, give me a or quality pussy. Yes. <laughs> so I, I was thinking that either they would have met through uh, improv or it could have been a situation where maybe um, Billy had tried to hit on one of her boyfriend. B- Billy had tried to hit on one of Julie's boyfriends. Maybe Billy tried to pick up Arthur. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Do you think Arthur's attractive? Well, it, it it's hard to say because there's many different types. You know, there's a there is a um, a type for every person, and mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm sure that there's this sort out there that finds the college professor type very erotic. You guys, so, you guys, in your fetishes, I you fetishize everything. I've never met. I, I've never. This is crazy. It's just like, oh, did you see him? He's got a uniform. <laughs> like, so what? Elf he has a patch- uniform. Elbow patches. Oh. <laughs> All right. Again, you boys can sexualize. Anything. I, of course, found that, um, you know, a, a complete surprise that the voice of Dr. Venture was Arthur. And I don't know if you realized that before I pointed it out. I did. Because I was. You did? Okay. I, I did know. Um, because I recognize his, I, I recognize his voice as being familiar, if nothing. So I looked him up. I didn't a- absolutely know that that was him, but I did recognize his voice. And then I went, "Ah, oh, there you go. It comes together." Would you change anything about any of the characters and/or their relationships and the interactions? Um. Well, you kind of touched on it earlier. I th- I wish Julie was nicer to Arthur. And I liked it when she was when she was identifying as Italian, and she tried to she made him a plate. But I really wish she was to him. That was that's the biggest thing. Yeah, and I think that um, 
if the series does move forward, because of course I don't know if they've announced if there's going to be a third season, I, I have to wonder if that might be in the works and the really doesn't start to appreciate Arthur, maybe he'll leave her. No, um, no. But I, I mean, he had a three-way. When, what's it going to take for him to leave, <laughs> for fuck's sake? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, maybe he's, uh, well... I, I, he could be desperate. I don't know. I mean, if if that really wasn't his thing and he did it just to make her happy, certainly he could be desperate. He doesn't think he can do better. They're domestic partner, supposedly, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah, he, uh, she, uh, she did that with her hand tied behind her back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, that I have to consider how I might change any of the characters. I I, I like the way. That um, Julie and uh, Marilyn, the mother-daughter chemistry. I mean, certainly it, it probably portrays what a modern relationship is all. You know, they say everybody goes to therapy nowadays, and this just kind of illustrates why people have reasons to go to therapy. The mother maybe isn't very attentive, so how I would change any of the characters is maybe I would have a little bit more understanding between the mother and daughter. Certainly not a whole lot, but maybe have more moments where um, they realize that there's fewer differences between them. Like when they got drunk at the spa. Right. (laughs) They did uh, connect when they're lighting the poop on that porch, didn't they? (laughs) That, that, yeah, that was a little akin to an adult going how uh, trick or treating. Mm-hmm. See, I like <laughs> I like Andrea Martin. Her name's Marilyn. Her character's name Marilyn. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, see, I like it because it rings so true. Because she's so passive aggressive, she drops these little gems constantly. She's like one. She's like um, Julie's. Like yes, uh, I'm gonna in order to make my career. Advance, I'm going to concentrate on becoming a YouTube star. And Andrea Martin's character says, uh, and not freezing my eggs. A curious priority. <laughs> I mean, she just, <laughs> like, just out of nowhere. Like, and then when she's giving her protege a, a graduation party, she's like, Julie, I can't wait to the day where I can give you a graduation party or a baby shower or a wedding shower, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, n- n- no hinting there, huh? <laughs> no, I mean that's the way mothers are. I thought that are these oh, sure. mothers that I know. That I uh-huh. There's very few moments where people actually get that sappy. I don't know why, but anyway, that's just. Oh yeah, and and just um, on the characters, of course, we both agreed that we uh, liked Arthur best, but I would say Marilyn's a close second. Yeah, me too. I think. Yeah, I think one of my favorite moments, and of course, this the the show is so fraught with celebrity appearances. Oh yeah, that unless you know, unless you know who every one of them is, you find yourself looking them up, and you're like, really, that's who that is. So I'm watching. Um, I forget which episode, the one where um, Julie and Marilyn both got their haircuts at the beauty school uh-huh. and, and it ended up being that mink stoll was a guest in that show she was and she yeah she was actually Marilyn's patient <laughs> her daughter had gotten kidnapped by a cult and now she could no longer control her daughter because the cult had control of her she was not very happy <laughs> and it was just the typical mink stole role you could tell that they just wrote that for her mm-hmm I recognized her right away just because I've seen far too many John Waters movies to not. (laughs) Go ahead and describe your favorite or least favorite episode. My favorite episode has got a couple different components. I believe it's called Patches. And at the beginning, her and Billy are trying to uh, get a job at what basically is supposed to be like Buzz. And it's this real modern office. People can bring in their therapy animals, like a woman has her bunny rabbit. Their office space is out in the middle of a room, and their chair is a teeter-totter. And it's just, like, so new, like, hipstery. It's just ridiculous, right? So Mm -hmm. they're doing this. um, They're trying to get hired full-time at this place where all they do is create lists. And one of the lists was... um, what are the worst smells in New York? And one of them was hot dog water, which will come up 
later in the episode. But anyway, so Julie goes to this, um, goes to a uh, audition, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. she, she has to bring her dogs with her because she had brought her dogs to work, and the dog had eaten this one lady's bunny rabbit, so <laughs> dogs were not welcome <laughs> at the office anymore. So she goes to this audition. She decides her character is going to be Australian, but she gets this really janky. <laughs> really horrible uh, and bo- <laughs> accent going and so with her standing there holding her dogs in this really stupid accent the people who are doing the audition think she's uh, special needs which uh, comes <laughs> to play where they think oh she's so cute look at her she's trying so hard let's give her a special part so they give her a part and uh, it, she's called Patches in this and she's selling balloon and she has this really stupid accent anyway so uh at the end they're throwing her this big party they all think she's special um they the the facade is blown and she, before it's blown she's sitting there and she had got hit in, with hot dog water by a vendor so she'd put on this kitty suit which were her pajamas from her child her childhood right and she's sitting there she's like sorry i have on my kitty suit my party dress smells like hot dogs (laughs) (laughs) so then they realize uh uh, yeah she's not special and they all hate her she loses her job it's just uh it's just horrible. But I just love that line. Sorry, I'm wearing my kitty suit. My body dress smells like hot dog. <laughs> anyway, that's one of my favorites. You know some fan is going to make up a t-shirt with that on it? Oh, that would be great. I'd get my kitty suit. <laughs> oh, dear. How about you? What's your favorite? Well, I have a few, and I made a short list. But just like you had touched on before, what Billion Pinata, and that was the one where, in the beginning of the episode, Billy and Julie are walking outside Stonewall, and it's all about National Coming Out Day. But of course, they end up going to a, a neighborhood bar in New Jersey because there was some sort of a, a fashion event, and um, they were going to be, you know, um, I see Kevin Smith was having a party. That's where they were going to Jersey, r- right? And so they get there, and of course. Um, Billy decides that it was going to be his coming out just so he can get a free drink at the bar. And then it was just from there, they ended up getting into their new circle of friends. That was also the same episode where Ming Stoll appeared as Marilyn's patient. Oh, and of course, the other best moment in that episode was when uh, Arthur was made kind of the... Um, the uh, morale person for his office at work. Birthday party. And, he was in charge yes. of the birthday. <laughs> and of course, you don't learn until at the end of the episode that the budget he was given, which he thought was for one party, was for like the whole year. So he <laughs> blew it. He did. In that episode, he ended up hiring a clown because he had a um, a children's birthday party. It come to find out his boss's boss's. T- <laughs> deathly afraid of clouds oh. and, and his co-workers all thought he was the cool guy now because he pranked the boss and the clown chaser around the office i liked it, it when she was sitting down with arthur at her desk and basically remember how exactly she says it he remember but she talks about having a her discreet massage wand and her car remember that <laughs> yes she said she said to, uh, or she apologized she said that that her filter is gone yes. now and that she'll she's upping her therapy yeah and she was down to she was down to four and a half something like that <laughs> yeah. yeah one was a skype session <laughs> yes uh, so i think that my other favorite episode that i'll narrow this down to is um, the episode called Blade Stallion. Oh, and, yeah. of course, <laughs> yeah, yes. that, that, is, that ends up being uh, the title because one of Billy's co-workers in the diner ended up being a former porn star. But, um, you know, the, the whole theme of the episode was a guilty pleasure. Of course, um, 
Arthur walked in on Julie watching her favorite kind of porn. Oh, yeah. And, mm. <laughs> and apparently she's a sick freak. It was very endearing for me, at least about the Arthur character, because, you know, he's very straight laced and he's very nurturing. You know, as we said, he took care of her. She was sick. But then come to find out when he walks in on her and her porn, she likes some pretty um, out there stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he felt shamed because his type of porn was still very sweet and innocent. Mm-hmm. You know, almost Sailor Moonish if you want to go there. But I, I felt bad for him because he's basically confessing to Julie that she ideal woman. And it, in true Julie fashion, she shuns him and makes him feel bad about it. That's, she did make him feel bad about it. If you wrote for television, what would your episode of Difficult People be about? Let's see. Uh, what did I write? Oh, I, I would like uh, to some of, I would do a flashback of, especially Julie and Billy's childhood, to see um, um, how and why they got this kind of aggressive and hostile way they look at the world. They both imply they're both chubby kids. And, um, I mean, that's a typical trope, right, to go back and see them getting being chubby and being abused or whatever it is. But they might, might be able to do something that's a little more cutting edge. But that's what I'd like to Okay. Um, well, I would like to see if I were to write an episode. I, I always find that um, um, flesh out more of the supporting characters are the more interesting ones. Because, of course, the show is about the main characters. And as you go along, you learn things about the people who are around them and those who make them strong. I think if I were to write an episode, it would where maybe Arthur and Marilyn ended up spending the day together. Maybe they got into some sort of a misadventure where they had to help one out. Well, yeah, because they kind of touched on that when they were riding together to help out Julie when she was sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just so great when Marilyn shows up at Arthur's work when they're worried about Julie um, becoming Italian. Marilyn says... Or no, Arthur says to Marilyn, is there something wrong? Is it about Julie? And Marilyn says, no, Arthur, I'm here to discuss the myth of the gluten-free diet. Oh, haha! yes. I like the way she always <laughs> calls him an alcoholic, casually throws that in. <laughs> so describe a difficult person you've known. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, somebody in the past, maybe you went to school with old co-worker but tell us about somebody that you i'm gonna go let's just go all the way back to right out of high school all right i'm gonna go that far back there was a woman or a girl at the time Mm -hmm. that i agreed to be roommates with and um after we agreed to be roommates right out of high school for some reason her opinion of me changed i really don't understand what i think it was just like that stupid girl thing Stu. like Girls can get competitive or they can decide they just don't like you or they can just be miserable humans for no good reason. And um, I had thought I I need to get out of this, but I really didn't know how because everything was already set up. And we ended up living together with two other girls. And by the time we all came together, she had gotten her hooks into these other girls, convinced them that I was some bad person. I really don't understand what the deal was. And so for the whole time I was living there, she made my life miserable with subtle things, saying stuff. I I can't even remember. I just remember crying and being miserable. And uh, she really, truly was a difficult person to me for no good reason. And uh, I ended up solving that problem by basically running away by getting a subletter. But um, I I guess I I don't know if I was to go back, I, I never would have put myself in that position i guess that's the only way to deal with it but sometimes there's just people that make your life hard and you really didn't ask for it you didn't do anything it's just them there's something about them that they're working out through you and um if you have a personality that is kind of uh seen as weak to them they will take full advantage of of some people just look for weakness in other ones to take advantage of and see you as a sucker and I don't know if she just saw me as somebody she could push around, but I, um, I've encountered a lot of people like that. That's my difficult okay. person. 
Okay. Well, for me, um, my difficult person is somebody that I once worked with. And this is the sort of person that was a very unique character. Somebody that when you met them, you felt that they stood out. And to some degree, you probably felt sorry for them because you felt that they were possibly misunderstood. And I consider myself an odd duck. So sometimes when I meet somebody and they stand out like that, makes me feel like I want to be the one that sits with them at the lunch table because maybe they don't have any friends. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's that's my downfall. And, of course, uh, it ended up biting me in the end because uh, we became friends. And I even had this person dog sit for me at the time I lived across the country. And I wanted to go home to visit my family for a holiday. So I didn't really have anyone I could trust because my ex and I had just broken up and I had just moved to my own place. But luckily, it was across the street from my work. So it wasn't really a bother for any of my coworkers to just drop in on their lunch and make sure my dog was walked. And this particular person, it was a, a lady, you know, I felt that she was misunderstood and I decided to become friends with her. And, you know, I trusted her enough to let her uh, have a key to my place and walk my dog. And before I transferred out of that department, because I had another opportunity, she she started picking on me for no good reason. I had had LASIK surgery done, and I was wearing sunglasses to work to adjust to, you know, the healing. And she just picked on me for longer than she should have, and I just kind of went off at her at one point mm -hmm. just like you know until you've had this yourself you can't really know what it's like so you know lay off lady uh -huh. and i don't know that was just too much for her so she and i didn't speak after that oh gosh isn't that awkward and uncomfortable <laughs> i mean she she's an animal lover so i i feel a kinship with her and i want to try to you know patch things up but i i also feel like she, she was just ruthless at, a, at one point. In Italian Pinata, the episode featured National Coming Out Day. Describe a situation where you found yourself having to share something about you that may have surprised someone else. Well, I was thinking about this, and I couldn't really pinpoint a, a specific one because it happens daily. Where I just, oh. <laughs> just the fact that I have a strong opinion, or I'll say kind of what probably what everybody's thinking, but I'm the one that says it. I've seen that expression on people's face, my whole wife, my family. Um, and it's one that's one thing. People cannot control your facial expressions. It's way too subconscious. So even though I've gotten this whole thing my whole life, I didn't say anything. It's like, well, I'm, I have connected brain cells and I could see your face. So I, like I said, it, it always, it kind of, it fucks with your brain if you give any buddy the power to which i have my whole life so when that happens i always feel to bring it to the surface and try to explain you know why i'm saying that i try not to i don't think i maybe i get defensive inside but i usually try to like well uh, of course i feel this way and and let me tell you why and this is why you should agree with me so that's usually what happens that okay. answers your question <laughs> <laughs> well i was going to say in my situation uh, something that I could share that may have surprised someone. And, and this, I guess this, this is um, uh, a crutch for some people, especially if you consider yourself a nerd. In a lot of like workplace situations, you're getting to know others and you're trying to figure out what things you have in common. And then it comes to a certain point where you're like, yeah, I'm a Star Trek fan. And then they all, all of a sudden autom automatically think, oh, you must live in your parents' basement. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, I, I swear I'm a grown man and I own a house and I pay taxes. <laughs> well, just don't take them to your uh, your recreation of the Star Trek deck. What is right. It <laughs> like a lot of network sitcoms before the rise in popularity of reality television, Difficult People is set in a major city. What are some others of your favorite shows that are set in a city? Well, all my references are going to be old because I don't. I haven't really embraced television since, well, not truly since, like, say, 95 for the last 10 years. So the ones that were in cities, of course, number one is Seinfeld. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore, Bob New, so they were in, she was in Minneapolis. Bob Newhart was in Chicago. Um, so those are my big three favorite that felt like uh, 
the city was part of the show on some level. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I'm a fan of a lot of older sitcoms, especially since I discovered Hulu. Mm-hmm. I uh, I wanted to go back and watch all the Mary Tyler Moore's because there are certain, you know, pop culture references in there, mm-hmm. especially in the gay community. I love a show with a strong female character. Um, but she wasn't that strong in a lot of ways. She was constantly in, in pursuit of that perfect man on some level, but in a lot of ways she was very carry on. Mm-hmm. So some of my favorite shows that have been set in the city was um, I used to watch Mad About You quite a lot, and that was set in New York City. And I used to watch that when I was doing my homework for college classes. Mm -hmm. That would be on endless repeats. I would watch reruns of Taxi with my dad. Mm -hmm. Probably something that might surprise people is I remember from when I was little, one of my favorite shows that I feel is – on a twisted way, similar to Difficult People, is Kate and Allie. Uh, just oh, yeah. because I remember that. <laughs> just remember. because it's set in the city, and it's the story of two people who are trying to survive life in the big city. Yeah. But uh, it, that, that's probably the, you know, very one of very few parallels that those two have. So, uh, bringing this to our last question... Of all, out of all the places you've been, if you could live anywhere that you aren't already living in, where would it be? So I had trouble answering that question. Um, living in Iowa most of my life, I always, like, I want to live next to the ocean. It was just kind of like this big fantasy. So now I am living next to the ocean. And I see the drawbacks and I see the advantages because we are getting into the rainy season here. And although it's a sunny day today, so my um, uh, my romantic notions of what it's like to live in an evergreen area have changed a little. So, um, but to, so I don't. I guess I achieved that fantasy of living next to the ocean, right? So I haven't replaced it with mm-hmm. anything else. And um, I don't know. Living here on my own, I think I've. I've come to terms with so many different demons that were inside of me. And in the past, when I thought about moving, it was always like that I thought that the new place would somehow change me. Whereas I learned when I moved here that I drug myself right along with me. So maybe it's not the location where you live, it's how you are with yourself. So I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. To where I live. <laughs> well, that's okay. It, it, it sounds like pretty much that um, you know that that you don't need a place to escape to because you've become maybe more comfortable with yourself just by being out on your own. Would that be fair? Yeah, because I always thought I always associated location with some kind of cachet that it gave you. Like I think people, a lot of people who live in L.A. really think the fact that L.A. or New York makes them a different better person they live there and i kind of bought into that for years and years and i don't buy into it anymore so so for me my answer to that would be and maybe i'm breaking my own rule there because i kind of did suggest someplace that you haven't been but if i did if my mother-in-law wasn't the sweetest person on earth (laughs) and didn't deserve to be left alone with her ingrateful other children. <laughs> um, I, I would certainly consider moving back to the Mile High City. I, I lived there for my formative twenties, so it kind of shaped the way I, I thought and felt about life in a bigger place. But if I couldn't live in the Mile High City, somewhere that I haven't been yet, that sounds sort of fantasy oriented like you were saying of the west is vancouver just because i've heard that vancouver is sort of the san francisco of canada well i've been to vancouver many times should talk to the (laughs) fade driver about that and see what he he has i'm sure he's been to different parts that i've never yeah it rains a lot up there (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna say i I was listening to a show recently uh you were talking about what you called your light bright yeah, my light bright hat. Yeah. <laughs> Work today. I was going to say, um, I, I might um, pass that on to Sue. He has depression issues, and I think that that probably helps. I mean, did you? Is it something that you got out, that you sought out on your own, or did a doctor recommend it to you? This is all of my own doings. I had heard about the 
actually, the first time I heard about it was when I was watching a show called Northern Exposure, one of my very favorite shows of all. I really wanted oh, to. I love that. I really had this notion of living in Alaska, that show, even though they filmed in Washington State. Well, maybe <laughs> I did it anyway. Mm-hmm. And with the long nights in Alaska, Joel had brought, it was the same kind of hat. It was a visor with lights on it and uh, given it to different people in the community to help. And one of the one of the people, I don't know who, I don't remember which character it was, but started abusing it, and they were getting really hyper because of it. And so <laughs> that's what I first time I heard of it. And last winter was rough. And it wasn't just because of the weather, the shit went. But I really wanted to be proactive. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I thought I'd try it. I don't know if it's a placebo effect. I really don't know. I mean, it certainly doesn't really make me feel high or anything. But I figure it can't hurt. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, ages ago when mom was still with us, actually, I think even when I was in high school, maybe, I remember she had one of those lights that they say uh, some artists use because it's supposed to simulate natural light. Oh, yeah. Have you heard? Yeah. And so it, it has a similar effect that being exposed to that, you know, somewhat natural light is supposed to improve your mood. Mm-hmm. So. I'm hoping it, it helps. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. This show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Smart Radio. Our email is tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Or leave us a voicemail at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.